Welcome to the show, everybody. Yes, it's Sunday night, 9.30pm. Just one of our shows. In fact, we've been doing quite a lot. Over the past few months, I've been on Republic Broadcasting Network five days a week. Last week, I decided to cut that down because I want to concentrate more on, well, let's say more concentrated information. Every single show that we put out on RBN on those five days a week contained really very interesting and important information, and I'm pretty pleased with all of them. In fact, if you do get a minute and you're looking for something to listen to, go back into the archive at windowsontheworld.net, the RBN radio show archive. We've got some fascinating stuff in there, and I hope to be posting those on maybe YouTube before we get taken down. Trouble up with all this, of course, is that it takes a lot of time. Also, our Friday shows are back. So Friday, 9.30pm, I will be there on YouTube while we're still on YouTube, and I will be doing shows live, which will then be on the channel. Have a look at last Friday's. It was with Jerry Marzinski and special guest George. It was about the presence of other worlds, and we've done many shows with Jerry. Jerry Marzinski is a licensed psychiatric practitioner who worked in state hospitals and prisons in the United States, basically looking into the whole phenomenon of paranoid schizophrenia, but more importantly, the phenomenon of invasion by negative entities and the voices which people hear, the voices which are not theirs, but people are led to believe are their own voices. Very interesting, and it's multi-layered and quite complicated, so we won't go into that tonight, but we have done a lot of shows on it. Yes, the Friday shows are back 9.30pm, live on YouTube and windowsontheworld.net. So, that's good news, and Tuesdays and Thursdays I will be on RBN Republic Broadcasting Network at 8pm. So that's all good stuff. Do take a look at the archive. Tonight we're going to be looking at some scenarios. We are, in fact, in a live exercise, and that live exercise is getting very transparent. We've been covering it ever since it started. And of course, this week we've got Beirut, fake revolution, regime change, all that going on as well. Not going to get into that tonight because I need to put that together for maybe a show next week, maybe Tuesday or Thursday. We're looking into some of the implications of that, the bigger picture, the overall idea of what's going on. Yes, tonight I'm going to be looking at a document And it came out in 2017 from the Johns Hopkins University. The Johns Hopkins University, of course, are the authors of the Event 201, along with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And, of course, it's all tied into the World Economic Forum, the United Nations and the World Health Organization. Of course, Imperial College is the London base of covid Johns Hopkins University in America is the US base and both these organisations are really part of this new system which, that is being introduced and I found this paper which was actually quite interesting, it came out in 2017 and it was about a pandemic. Now we've had this Rockefeller document from 2010 about the scenario of lockstep which is this increasingly authoritarian response during a pandemic and if you haven't read that I would look at that it's a 2010 Rockefeller document from the I think Institute of Technology and you can find that actually on windowsontheworld.net we've done quite a few shows on it so go into the archive it's all there I think the paper's linked but I'm not sure what the show was called because we do so many yes It's interesting, this document, because it's called SPARS Pandemic Scenario 2017. And what's fascinating to me about it is everything that's happening now and being rolled out as though it's in some way spontaneous is actually part of the planning and the exercise that's rolled out in this document. So protest and dissent are actually factored in. That's really important because if you're protesting against this, you're factoring yourself in to the scenario. 
So in other words, you have to be a bit more unpredictable in what you're doing or just carry on as normal. Carrying on as normal is pretty unpredictable because also it's an invisible way of keeping going. And what I'm seeing around me, being in London the last few days, is that things are pretty much back to normal. There are a lot of people wearing masks, but generally on the streets there is a kind of normality returning, which means, of course, it could soon be time for the second wave when all those responsible people, irresponsible people rather, who went out, (laughs) um, are blamed for the second wave. Well, yeah, it's interesting in this paper because protest and dissent is factored in. The failure of public bodies and the failed cure. Now, they bring in this cure and they have this sort of, it's a made-up scenario, obviously. And they bring in this cure, but then the cure gets discredited and then they bring in the vaccine. It's quite interesting the way it all pans out. The document is called from the Centre for Health Security.org. And slash our work, pubs, archive, publishing, PDFs, the pan, spars pandemic scenario. So if you put spars pandemic scenario, it'll come up. I'll put it in the chat for tonight, actually. And I'll probably link it to the website also. But the scenarios predicted um, are varying degrees of access to information technology, varying levels of fragmentation being apparent among populations along social, political, religious, ideological and cultural lines, a scenario matrix was constructed for this planned rollout kind of exercise in an imaginary uh, document, in an imaginary scenario within a document. So it says that a scenario matrix was constructed illustrating four possible worlds shaped by these trends with consideration given to both constant and unpredictable driving forces. It says here, early in the SPARS pandemic, public health and medical professionals were hopeful that the outbreak could be contained through case identification and isolation. It quickly became clear, however, that this strategy was not as effective as initially hoped. First, challenges in identifying mild cases limited the impact of isolation programs because the initial symptoms of SPARS, listen to this, this is good, closely resembled influenza. Many who contracted SPARS did not immediately seek care, assuming they merely had the flu. Fortunately, some who thought they had the flu chose to isolate themselves at home. And we actually see self-isolation and social distancing introduced in this document, which is quite interesting. So these terms don't just arrive from nowhere on the news channels. They're thought about well in advance. This is a psychological program that they've put together here. It's about the psychology of a pandemic, a created pandemic. It says Thanksgiving's holidays and Black Friday, however, fewer infected persons remained home. You see what's going on here? In other words, all those people flocking to the beach have started the second wave. Of course, there's no evidence for it and there won't be any evidence for it because When we start looking at this, the evidence simply is not there and the evidence has been skewed. It has been fabricated and really we're looking at a pack of lies. I've been looking at this for four months and I can quite well, I can say with some confidence that that is the case because we've looked at the statistics. We've analysed it. We've had people who know what they're talking about with statistics and we've looked at the documentation and we've found it all to be wanting including, of course, the virus itself, which has never been purified or identified. COVID-19 has not been purified or identified as COVID-19. Therefore, in real terms, it doesn't actually exist. We're going to get onto that a bit later. But last Thursday, if you're interested in this subject, have a listen to the show I did with James McComiskey. He's the author of a book called The Ultimate Conspiracy, The Biomedical Paradigm. And I would recommend that as an introduction to the whole area of allopathic medicine and how it has been based upon assumptions, lies, and basically profit for the pharmaceutical companies. 
most listeners will know that, but really worth having a listen to the interviews I did with James and looking at his book because he wrote to the National Virus Research Laboratory and UC, UC College, that's uh, University College Dublin, and he asked for proof that the virus actually exists and no proof was forthcoming. And we're get, going to get into that in the show tonight, but it's included in that last show we did on RBN. But it says here, Spars transmission was accelerated by infectious individuals who had not yet become symptomatic. That's the asymptomatic bit, you see. It's all in here. Everything's here written down. Together, these factors led to significant spikes in the number of reported cases. Well, they've gone one better than that because the number of reported cases and the confirmed cases and all the rest of it we've been examining for so long, I won't even go into it. But because of the way this is actually analysed and the data's analysed, it means that pretty much everybody can be diagnosed with COVID-19 because most people carry some form of what they call a coronavirus, which is a common cold. Uh, but it says here, it's very interesting this, it says a discredited cure, you see, was followed by the vaccine. That's basically what this is about, a discredited cure. So this cure gets discredited a bit like hydrochloroquine. In other words, that is the cure, but they've discredited it. And now they're going to bring in the vaccine. So that's quite interesting. It says public interest in spas had begun to wane. I think we're at that particular point now. So this is interesting, isn't it? In late April, remember this is a scenario that came out in 2017, the CDC had publicised and updated case fatality rate estimate, suggesting the SPARS was only fatal in 0.6% of cases. Now that's interesting as well, isn't it? I wonder where they get their statistics from, because obviously if we look at the real statistics here, we're talking about even less than that. But it's running along similar lines, isn't it? A little bit like the lockstep document from the Rockefeller Foundation. It says this figure matched public sentiment, widely expressed on social media, that spars was not as dangerous as initially thought. So this is interesting because what they're doing here is they go into this in the document that basically they are preparing for the public to find out that this whole thing's a scam and then fight back on a different angle, which is, of course, the position we're in at the moment. It says, combined with persisting doubts about Calovisia, which is the discredited cure, and the lack of a commercially available SPARS vaccine, the new lowercase fatality rate estimate led the public to grow increasingly hostile toward continued SPARS messaging. In order to overcome the public disinterest, the Centers for Disease Control and the FDA, in concert with other government agencies and their social media experts, began developing a new public health messaging campaign about SPARS. Colovisivir which is this uh, cure, alleged cure, which they've made up. This is a made-up name, obviously. Uh, and the forthcoming vaccine, Coravax. Yeah, it's pretty good, this, isn't it? I would say it's pretty much where we are at the moment, and it's pretty good as an example of what has actually been going on. So I'd recommend you have a read of this. The purpose of this campaign was to create a core set of messages that could be shared by all public health and government agencies over the next several months, during which time the SPARS vaccine would be introduced. Even though the disease was less fatal than initially thought, it remained expensive to treat in its severe form, and even mild cases had substantial impacts on economic productivity across the country. Well, no kidding with that one, is there really? But yeah, this is yet another uncanny prediction and evidence that we are in a pre-planned exercise the real-time event has not yet occurred which is interesting this is where i think we are at the moment so it's quite an interesting period this as to how things are going to develop from here compliance testing and the introduction of systems globally is what this is really about look at the world economic forum website look at the covid page look at what they're putting on there and it's hundreds and hundreds of documents but basically what they're doing is they are using these kind of opinion pieces and news items on there 
to shape the flow of how this is actually being presented. So again, we're talking about something that is being played out in real time, which is really like an exercise. The World Economic Forum and the biometrics industry are putting everything in place. That's what this is about. There's a new global health system that's being rolled out and a new financial system which is being rolled out. And of course, the biometrics industry is in overdrive. Go to biometricupdate.com and check out what's happening with scanners, with the whole of the surveillance industry, from heat-seeking cameras to fingerprint to uh, heat testing. It's all in there. Everything that they're talking about is in there. But our show, yeah, on RBN last Thursday with James McCominsky um, featured the latest response from the National Virus Research Laboratory and the UCL College Dublin, which I referred to earlier on. Now, this is interesting because I've got the documentation and the request to provide proof that COVID-19 had been isolated and purified. Now, remember, according to Cox postulates and the way that the industry and science actually describes this is that it has to be isolated and purified in other words they're looking at tissue infected tissue at the moment which is no good that means that the virus has not been isolated now there was an argument that was put up on the radio show the other day someone sent me some pictures of what had been taken under an electron microscope which was assumed to be COVID-19 it was a picture of something it's like saying well I've got a picture of you, therefore that is actually you. No, it's a picture of me, but it might not be a picture of me. In fact, it could be um, a simulation. It could be a computer simulation of me. So in other words, it's, an, it's a non-argument. It doesn't make any sense to say that. It's, it's, uh, it's, it destroys itself with basically its own concept to do that doesn't make any sense but it says these pictures claim to show COVID-19 infection but of course they don't prove anything the admission that no evidence of the actual isolated or purified virus exists was in actuality a very useful admission because it means that there is no authority that is going to say that they have purified and isolated COVID-19. The response from the National Virus Research Laboratory was that they do not purify and isolate viruses. Well, if they don't purify and isolate viruses by their own terms, that means that they are saying that basically there is no virus because unless they've isolated and purified it, it doesn't exist. I know I'm reiterating this, but some people don't seem to understand it, so... I just thought I would kind of clarify that a bit more. But whether COVID-19 exists or not is of no consequences as it is a driver for the new world system adequately described on the World Economic Forum website. Do take a look at all that and also go to biometricupdate.com because these people who are in the biometrics industry describe this scenario we're in as surfing the wave of COVID-19. So, yeah. This is interesting. A crowdjustice.com petition has been put up. Now, this is quite interesting. I'm going to go through some of this because it nails what's actually happened in the UK. And it's a yeah, crowdjustice.com, the Coronavirus Act 2020 is null and void um, by the people's Brexit. Well, obviously, they're full of hate, aren't they? They obviously voted for Trump and they must think that Elvis lives on the dark side of the moon. So that's a good start, I think. But uh, yes, if anyone doesn't know what that means, uh, just forget it because we've been banging on about it for so long. It's the way that the fake left describes the imagined right. And it all came out of the British intelligence services. So whenever you see someone write down, I suppose you think Elvis lives on the dark side of the moon. It could be 7-7 Brigade, which is this group of military trolls, or it could be other paid agents. It could be Hasbro. It could be anything. But what, what you're dealing with here is a propaganda war we're just in a propaganda war and the best propaganda wins so let's get everything down to a good sound bite <laughs> but it says here it says it's a stand-up letter and mask law updates it says it says the deadline for a reply from the government or public health england for proof of the existence of so-called covid19 was the 22nd of july as predicted no reply was received to this letter as they have no proof that's what they're claiming here and we've kind of uh, 
prove that point ourselves with the letter that James McCominsky sent to the National Virus Research Laboratory, uh, both in Ireland and in the mainland. So it says here, we are the people's Brexit. Oh, they must be so full of hate, these people. A group of solicitors, legal researchers and campaigners. We have been extensively researching the current legal situation since the lockdown, the illegal lockdown, deprived us of all of our democracy, human rights and freedoms. Well, that's a fair point, isn't it? Yes, it says we have now established that the Coronavirus Act 2020 is null and void. There are many reasons for this, the main one being that um, Section 1 of the Act defines coronavirus as being COVID-19 or its other name SARS-CoV-2. However, by virtue of the fact that it is not legally, medically or scientifically recognised as a disease or virus, it cannot be legislated against and this makes the whole Act null and void. That's a good legal argument. And I think the beginning of the show prepared for that point there. I'm glad that that's been brought up in the document because I hadn't read all of this before we went on air. But it says the reason for this is that COVID-19 has not been subjected to the 130 year established legal, medical and scientific procedure that recognise if it is actually a disease or virus or not. So it recognises if it is actually a disease, a virus or not a disease or a virus, which is known as Koch's postulates. Now, this is very flawed as well. We've gone through all this and we've done several shows on it. Not something I'm going to get into here, but it goes into the whole germ theory of medicine, Louis Pasteur and the germ theory, which really came out of the idea that germs and bacteria spread because of bad air. And there could be some truth in that, but then it goes on to make massive assumptions which have never been proved. And of course, Louis Pasteur on his deathbed actually admitted that he had been wrong in a lot of his assumptions. So, very interesting. A little bit like Darwin, he was another one who actually refuted his own theories at the end of his life. Also in a series of letters. All fascinating stuff, but it says the government has acted ultra-virus and against the rule of law. Further, there are a multitude of procedural and legal errors made when the government enacted this legislation, including enforcing the Act on the 23rd of March with the lockdown before it actually became law, with royal assent on the 25th of March. So, it says, in addition, the Act facilitates misreporting of deaths from various illnesses that it is claimed are also suffering with COVID-19, as doctors are told to use guesswork as to the cause of death. Well, I think we've proved that conclusively. So anyone who thinks that's an exaggeration, well, just do some research. It's absolutely appalling what's been going on. The misdiagnosis is a criminal event, basically. I won't say it's just criminal. It's It's a huge event that really needs looking into. This has been happening since the 10th of March, long before the Act became law and allows the COVID-19 statistics to increase rapidly. We've covered how the statistics have been absolutely manufactured. As the phrase goes, there's lies, damn lies and statistics. And when we look at who's supplying the statistics, it's no surprise at all. And if you look at Ipsos Mori and all these people who've done the polls in the past, they are involved in the climate change agenda. No, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's where the citizens assemblies came in and George Soros backed organization. I think it's involved in the Sortition Foundation. They all got in, uh, involved in the pushing of the citizens assemblies. And that is another massive scam and a nail in the coffin of what people used to call democracy, because it's about people being steered into a a predetermined outcome and also getting them to accept massive taxation, which they would not normally allow. For instance, having your house retrofitted at the cost of £25,000 per property. Don't worry, the banks will lend you the money. If you can't pay, they'll take your house. But it carries on here. Also, existing legislation should have been used for a pandemic such as the Infectious Diseases Act 1984. And if this was not sufficient, the Civil Contingencies Act 2004 should have been used. Now, this is interesting because there was a group of barristers on YouTube. It got very few hits, this. They were discussing that this 1984 Act should not have been used because it didn't adequately legally frame what the whole thing was about now we have done a show on that so i'm not going to go into it tonight 
But yes, the Civil Contingencies Act 2004 is an act that is repealed after a very short period of time. In other words, we have a state of emergency, but we're going to review it in a couple of months. That's basically it. I'm paraphrasing there, but that's basically uh, what they're getting at here, I think. This would have protected our human rights, as Section 20 of the Act demanded, along with other requirements and protections under the Act, including due proportion parliamentary scrutiny and a duration of only 30 days maximum that's it so 30 days there's a review so in other words if the scam has been exposed and no one's dying anymore then we have a review and we get back to normal with this other act the in uh, sorry the 1984 infectious diseases act it removes that and it also removes a lot of rights which ties in with the covid act the covid act removes all rights It's the most draconian piece of legislation ever introduced in this country, in the history of our laws. So let's carry on here. Um, It says this would have protected our human rights. Yeah. Section 20 of the Act demanded, along with other requirements and protections under the Act, including the proportion, parley, due proportion, parliamentary scrutiny and a duration of 30 days maximum. Reiterating that point, this is outlined in the Department of Health's report, UK Influenza Pandemic Preparedness Strategy 2011. And yes, have a look at that. It says this report made it clear that the rule of law should be upheld and life should carry on as normal for the healthy not the deliberately induced fear and hysterics and disproportionate reactions as an exercise for taking away our human rights, civil liberties and destroying our economy in the process, which is exactly what it's done. But the point of all this, it's got nothing to do with the virus. This is the fourth industrial revolution. This is the new global health monitoring system. The Global Health Monitoring Pandemics Board, have a look at them, have a look at the people behind it. This is a multi-agency, multi-layered agenda bringing in several agendas, which is why the public don't get it, because they are thinking small, the globalists are thinking very big, and the stuff that's coming in has been thought about for quite a long time. COVID-19 is an accelerant, it's a driver of an agenda. It's not a pandemic, it's a driver. So in other words, this is where what I'm talking about here kind of joins together with what's really going on because they're really stating that without actually saying it. So that's that's pretty good. It says it's an abomination that has been used by the government to illegally seize absolute power and control and has no place in a modern democracy. Well, we don't live in a modern democracy and it's not our government that is illegally seizing absolute power. It's global governance. There's a big difference. World government is not global governance for all the conspiracy theorists out there. I think there's a new world order because the world, the term new world order is kind of there for people who know a bit about global governance, but they're going to get discredited by the 98% of the public who say that's a conspiracy theory. So if you say in response to that, no, I'm talking about unstructured global governance. What do you know about that? And they will know nothing about it. And then you can inform them what unstructured global governance is and give them examples and tell them where it came from, from 1987, from our common future onwards, through the Rio conferences, um, to the legislation, to the Paris Agreement, all the rest of it. Um, And it, it, it goes on from there and goes into think tanks and NGOs and the whole of the new new age movement. So. People can't think this big. They can't think of a coordinated exercise which is being played out, which is on multi levels because they're taught to think in this kind of very um, straightforward linear way, which is what the education system is all about. The education system is actually to, to direct and prevent change within the individual. So education prevents change and it directs change. And we hear a lot about psychological steering. We have the behavioural change unit of the British government. It all comes out of military intelligence. So this is a military intelligence psychological operation for global governance. And it's way above the heads of most of the public because the public think that those Muppets in Parliament... Um, the bumbling Boris Johnson, two other idiots that are with him on podiums, are actually running anything. When it's clear to anyone who has any insight into how things actually work or strategy can see that these people are merely repeating what they've been told and they have no power to change anything. 
So let's carry on with this. As COVID-19 has been never been isolated and proven to be a virus or a disease, it cannot be tested for. Instead of COVID-19 being tested for, what is actually being tested for is genetic material and a RNA sequence based upon lung fluid extracted from Chinese patients. This genetic material is found in everyone and a higher level is found in very ill people suffering from any illness. Remember, the first cases of what became COVID-19 were about 27 cases of pneumonia. Well, that isn't actually that much of a massive big deal because 27 cases of pneumonia in a place like Wuhan is not a lot when you look at the pollution there and when you start looking at what was happening locally. We've been into all that. Actually, John Rappaport, John Rappaport's very good on this. He's done some very good stuff on the psychology of it all. That's no more fake news. I would recommend his website. He's very clear on this stuff. He's got a good angle on it. By a good angle, I mean he's got insight. So carry on with this. Further, it says the test that is being used is called the RT-PCR test. This is the Caris, Carrie Mullins, Carrie Mullis test. Carrie Mullis actually stated that it wasn't for what they're using it for. He's dead now. But look him up. He was totally discredited. And the things they say about him, oh, he was a climate change denier, you know. He was a climate change denier. So you can't, you know, you can't really believe him. But they are using his PCR test. So that's kind of ironic, isn't it? It says here, further the test that has been used, yeah, the PCR test, and the inventor said it should never be used for diagnostics. That's Carrie Mullins. So it says here, this is because it is not a gold standard test that would give 100% accuracy. In fact, there is a false positive rate of 80% for this test. This means that the test is meaningless as it is just testing for genetic material and not coronavirus. And even that is only a real positive for one in five people. Other tests being used are as bad or even worse. Further, using these tests, anyone can test either positive or negative, depending on how much or how many cycles the specimen is amplified by. And as such, the test can easily be rigged. So what Carrie Mullins, Carrie Mullins' test, the PCR test was all about, was, was basically replicating RNA so it could have a reading. So it was basically you'd keep multiplying the amount to try and get a proper reading. That's my understanding of it. And I think that's what we went over in last week's show. So it says we want the government to be immediately banned from conducting any further coronavirus testing. They are not really testing for coronavirus, but these results are being weaponized and used to deprive us of our democracy. Democracy, human rights and freedoms, of course, it says here. Also, our finances are being affected, no kidding, and our economy destroyed, all based upon false results. Well, I'd go a bit further than that because this is a global action plan and it has nothing really to do with the virus, but the virus is the driver. It says people are also dying as treatment is being denied as the NHS focus is only on so-called COVID-19. People have also been so frightened by the relentless media brainwashing that they are now not requesting urgent medical help when they need it. Further, the lockdown and social distancing were measures that were forced upon us and were based upon advice by government advisers, in inverted commas, advisers. A bit like experts agree, a bit like scientists say, where which ones have these people got any credibility? Are they actually qualified to be talking about what they are talking about, etc.? Check out things like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and you will find out that they are, they are not a scientific body and this is done in exactly the same way. It says, yes, advisors modelling, you see. It's all about modelling, computer modelling. Computer modelling is disastrously wrong most of the time when well, it has been with climate change. Estimates, yeah, and reports that aren't even peer-reviewed. So you get all these people going, send me the peer-reviewed document, and you actually can send them peer-reviewed documents, uh, but that's not good enough. Then they change the angle again, and they start attacking the person who's written the peer-reviewed document. So with these liars, you cannot win, but you can win by facts. You can win with a legal argument, and that's what these people are trying to do here, which is pretty good. These advisors from the Imperial College, including Professor Neil Ferguson, have a track record of complete failure. That's 100% true, and that's a legally binding statement. They have a track record of complete failure. 
including the slaughter of millions of healthy animals and the ruin of livelihoods during the foot and mouth debacle. These absurd measures have no proven medical or scientific effectiveness and even the opposite is true and these measures are considered dangerous by many top international doctors. This is even reinforced by the World Health Organization, who'd have thought, uh, who in their report, Non-Pharmaceutical Intervention for Pandemic Influenza, National and Community Measures from 2006, which is on the official American government health website. The writers of which include current members of SAGE, the government advisors, this Report criticises forced isolation and quarantine, branding these measures ineffective and impractical. It also states that legal authority and procedures for implementing interventions should be understood in advance and should respect cultural differences and human rights. Okay, crucially, the report states that a phase six of a pandemic... Now, this is interesting because we had a level six pandemic with bird flu. And you know what? That was never rescinded. I think that's about 2006. Go back and have a look. The World Health Organization and the UN never rescinded that level six pandemic of that bird flu outbreak. So, crucially, yes, the report states that at phase six of a pandemic, when a pandemic is officially declared, the World Health Organization declared it to be a pandemic on the 11th of March 2020, of course. Measures such as tracing and quarantine should not be attempted. This means that according to the World Health Organization themselves, neither the UK or the rest of the world should have been put in lockdown. It states patient isolation and tracing and quarantine of contacts should cease as such measures will no longer be feasible or useful. We feel that the NHS tracing app and the 25,000 tracers are yet more infringements of our rights. Now, this was obviously done some time ago because in my view the nhs tracing app is another part of the collapsing of the nhs it was a monumental failure so remember that we have a new privatized uh, global health system being put into place all based on data on your personal data and you being surveilled and everything being monitored through this new global health system so what this is about is this compliance testing and testing of the new system while people are scrambling about in masks let's check check and see how many people are complying oh let's have a look on our cctv at manchester town center oh there's i would say 70 people are in masks let's have a look at birmingham oh we've got about 75 there oh let's have a look at london oh that's about 65 to 70 percent that's pretty good so i think they're just using the masks to look on global cctv to see how many people are wearing them and of course it's going to wear down the immunity of those who do wear them for so when the second wave comes in it's going to be more effective everybody wins it's a win-win situation for those surfing the wave of covid19 Yes, so that's interesting, isn't it? It says, this also has the sinister potential to be weaponized and used to terrify the population into thinking they have so-called COVID-19, also the potential to keep a pandemic going indefinitely. Of course, that's the whole idea. Because when you've got something as indefinable as this, which can't be defined and it hasn't been measured, then it can appear anywhere and it can use any symptoms it wants to. Because remember, there's always infections around, there's always disease, there's always bacteria, there's always something cropping up that's mutating. And once you start looking into what viruses really are and change your view of your, to use a new age term, paradigm, then you will start to see things in a slightly different way. And actually, it starts to make proper sense because otherwise it doesn't make sense. But it says further, the report concludes, lockdown did not work back in 1918, even during war and under desperate disadvantaged circumstances and the absurd social distancing measures currently being demanded did not even get a mention. And you can read it in full. um, You can read that all on this Coronavirus Act 2020 is null and void. So I'm pretty pleased to put that into a show because it's pretty much summarizes a lot of the things that we've brought up over the past four months and remember that these words that are used sustainability 
resilience, diversity, vibrant. These words mean exactly the opposite and these words can mean anything they want them to. What does sustainable development mean? Everything and nothing, according to Enrico Giovanni, who trains over 33,000 students in sustainability in Italy and is part of, yes, that big conspiracy theory, the New World Order, because he is one of the speakers at the Global Governance Summit, the World Governance Summit in Dubai. That was 2019. They do have one every year, but sometimes they change the names of them. However, there you go. Great information, I think, tonight. And I'll be back on Tuesday. I'm going to do these Sunday shows still regularly, obviously, every Sunday. But they're going to be a bit shorter. I think maybe 30 to 40 minutes. We've got about 40 minutes tonight. I'll be back on Tuesday at 8 p.m. UK time on Republic Broadcasting Network and on Thursday. Also back on Friday for our 9.30 p.m. shows live on YouTube, which we stream and I'll have guests. Those are really popular. And I think that they are better in some ways. So there you go. We've got plenty of choice. Thanks for listening. Help us on Patreon and PayPal. Join in with helping us with our film, which everyone will get a copy of who supports us. And of course, there's going to be screenings and events when things get back to the old normal, because we're not having the new normal, are we? Some of us uh, don't like change. Some of us uh, don't like vibrant communities. You know, some of us uh, probably think that Elvis lives on the dark side of the moon. So that's it from me. I'll see you all on Tuesday. Thanks for listening, everybody.